Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Framerate is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or online store. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE6. Why are your eyes closed? Because I got surgery. For why? For what? Yeah. I'm blind. You're not blind. My eyes are closed. That doesn't make you blind. I can't see. You can't see because your eyes are closed. I regret everything. What did you do to your eyes? I wanted to be like Superman, so I had the doc give me surgery to give me laser vision. Is that possible? For 300 bucks, it is. That's pretty cheap. That's what I said. So why are your eyes closed? I can't control it. Your eye lasers. Right. So you can't open your eyes. Or just lasers everywhere. Wow. It is like vomiting Armageddon. From my pupils. You gotta be honest. I don't believe you. But it's true. Dude, open your eyes. I can't. You can. With great power comes great responsibility. Open them. I won't. Dude. I won't, Josh. Look, Scarlett Johansson in a bikini. Nope. Look, David Copperfield in a banana hammock. Dude, where? You have laser vision. That's what I've been saying. We could do all kinds of stuff with this. We could, we could do shows, tour. People would pay all kinds of money to see something like this. (laughs) It's the frame rate. Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 127, named after the highway I grew up on. I'm Tom Mary. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, famous actor from that sketch that you just watched me in with our friends. Your eyes are open, Film though. Ride. Am I going to get totally... Dis- oh, I just had them removed. These had are removed. robo... Yeah, they're robo implants. I'm good to Thank go now. goodness. That, of course, that of course is from our friends over at Film Riot uh, in celebration of the upcoming Man of Steel... Release, which, by the way, Man of Steel, very, very excited about. I'm irrationally excited about it because I'm not normally a Superman guy. But they uh, they did a, a how to do the heat ray uh, eye effect on uh, their so, channel. Oh, okay. Head on over to Film Riot at doc- nice. or YouTube.com slash Film Riot. There. Good show and good use of laser vision. Let's start off with the big story. This just in, the big story. Intel is ready to throw money at the cable industry to make them, allow them to send television over the internet. According to Reuters, Intel will pay as much as 75% more than traditional cable rates. Uh, Granted, usually if you're a starting cable system, there really isn't much of such a thing. But if you're a smaller cable system, you have to pay a lot more than the big guys, right? Because you get discounts in bulk since Intel doesn't have any subscribers. They will have to pay more. But to get CBS News Corp and Viacom to reach an agreement, they've apparently decided to just throw piles of cash in front of them. Uh, Dude, and this is exactly the next chapter of what we hope to see from the Intel saga. The whole reason that Intel's on our radar is because they are an outsider who has the ability to come in without a dog in the fight, without any kind of vertical distribution, but simply to represent what consumers actually want and make it happen. And part of that story is that they're going to have to pay a hell of a lot more money in order to make these things happen. And the fact that they're actually, that we're hearing stories of them actually sitting down at the negotiating table and being willing to pay, uh, you know, almost twice the other rates. This is extraordinarily good news for folks like you and me, who from the beginning, Tom, have made it clear we only want one thing. That's the ability to watch whatever we want, whenever we want with a simple interface. And it sounds like you two, or uh, that Intel is at least walking the walk after talking the talk, which is good. Yeah, Reuters is, is trying to walk a fine line in this story, but essentially they're saying CBS, News Corp, and Viacom have reached agreements, but no deals. Now, if I'm reading the tea leaves right, 
that means they've convinced them to actually do this. They're like, look, we have a distribution plan. This is how it works. This is how much we'll pay you. And now it's just kind of nailing down exactly what those numbers are and what the legal niggery stuff is, niggly stuff, sorry, uh, that you need to have in there, all of those little fiddly bits. Uh, and and then, then they'll, they'll close the deal, most likely. NBC, Universal, however, is not actually that close. So we... we Still don't have any deals, though, Brian. I mean, if this is going to be really expensive and we don't have any deals yet, is this thing going to launch by the end of the year? Uh, I mean, by the end of the year, I think it would be very ambitious. It's very difficult. Of This thing lives and dies not on the hardware, ironically. We're at the point where, you know, Intel, a hardware company, is doing the simple bit, which is, you know, give us a gizmo that lets us access everything. Uh, create a UI that's easy to use. I mean, those those are all things that we know Intel is able to do. But uh, but just as Hulu's ability to be sold to a good company breaks down to who's going to allow them to continue to keep their distribution deals, uh, we're we're seeing the same thing with with Intel. And uh, uh, I would be shocked and thrilled if they were able to whip everything up and get this out by the end of the year. I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, I'm cautiously How much would you optimistic. Pay? Eric, Hug uh, Eric Huggers, head of Intel Media, says this is going to cost you more. It can't uh, cost you too much more, though, right? Well, I mean, okay, here's the weird part. Like, I've given up. Many people think that cord cutting is about saving money. And yes, it drives all of us nuts that we're spending $100, $150 on cable and related crap and, that we don't even use. And it does drive me nuts. However, that money is budgeted right now. And I am surviving on spending $100, $150 a month on my cable bill. Uh, if we can get to a point where I still pay the same amount, and let's, let's face it, if I'm if out of that $100, $150, I'm pretty much only watching Cartoon Network, Boomerang, Nickelodeon uh, and uh, er everything else I watch online, you know, Adult Swim, you know, I guess it's still Cartoon Network. But it's like uh, if I can keep paying the same amount and fundamentally change my interface, that alone will be worth it. And I'll drop two hundred dollars on a on a set top box that does that. Um, I mean, what about you? Like, are you how annoyed with you with your user experience and how much of it of that annoyance has to do with the costs associated with it? Yeah, well, it has to do with the idea of I, I pay for the lowest tier of DirecTV right now because I just want to keep one foot in the water there to see what they're doing uh, and get HBO Go, right? Those, those are the only two things going on in my life that keep me tied sure. to a traditional cable operator. I Some people are like, how can you do a show about cord cutting and still not have cut the cord? I kind of have to not cut the cord. Both of us do to be able to compare. But it doesn't annoy and, and me the, when it's the like the short answer. And and actually, on that, we should point out, like, like yes, we could cut the cord. Uh, but or let me put it this way: the only way for you and I to cut the cord and remain in touch with uh, cultural reality and the shows that we like would be to pirate. And I think you and I have drawn a, a fine line in the sand. Yeah. You're know, like, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're ready. So that's we're ready to take the jump and watch all the things that we can watch legally without the Correct. cord. And that's Correct. why we're both excited about this, actually. And yeah, Correct. if I could pay the same amount or even a little more and get all the things I want and not have to worry about things that I don't want, taking up a bunch of space on the guide, I'm all for that. Yeah, absolutely. That leads man. us to another option, another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. All Things D reporting last week, AT&T... Joining up with Peter Chernin, the former News Corp guy, for a joint bid for Hulu. And it's the dance continues. We're going to probably be talking about this until either Hulu withdraws itself from the market or sells itself to somebody. But now it, now it sounds like AT&T with its U-verse and mobile might jump into the game and wouldn't be a major bidder on its own, but, but throw some money in with Peter Chernin and be a minority stakeholder. This is another one of those weird moments because, by and large, I hate uh, AT and T. I think that it represents, uh, you know, vertical distribution monopoly. Uh, I think that it represents the worst of what we experienced in the 20th century. However, in this game, they are like Intel. They're another guy without a dog in the fight. They they are not content manufacturers. I mean, they do distribute with their Uverse pl uh, platform, and and they would obviously try to get away with favoring their. Um, you know, their their wireless distribution capability. But again, they would only be representing the interests of the consumers and they, they should 
you know, hopefully have the ability to get in touch and get those distribution deals to where we would have the complete variety, the complete catalog of what we want. So weirdly, I find myself okay with this. I mean, even though I don't like you guys, I don't trust you guys, but um, in this case, I, I, I certainly would prefer it to something like, you know, it remaining in News Corp and uh, Disney's hands. I don't, I don't know. It depends on what they do with it. I, if, if it were a, a Peter Chernin gets to like bring this to the masses sort of thing and AT&T's contribution is we'll make it easier to get this on mobile, then maybe I'm okay with that. But if it becomes a like, we're going to actually encourage them to lock it down and make it only available for mobile or only available as an AT&T U-verse, I don't know if I like that idea very much. Maybe if it is like Intel where it's like, hey, it's AT&T U-verse, but it's over the internet. You can have any provider you want. I just don't see AT&T working. They don't think that way. And so no. I'm, I'm worried with what they're going to end up wanting to do with it. I guess, okay, now, and, and I'm totally on the same page with you on that, and I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. However, of everybody we've heard who's interested, uh, AT&T is closer to something like Hulu buying, or I'm sorry, something like Yahoo buying Hulu, then, uh, then some, you know, just get it out of the hands of the content providers. You know, those are the guys who have a strong vested interest in making a vertical distribution deal to favor their content. And that's why we have this wishy-washy, some content available at certain times when, you know, when it's to uh, pleases the content producers or whatever, uh, get someone else out there who's closer to a middleman is what we need for the consumer benefit here. Yeah, I kind of think Yahoo may be my favorite in that respect. I don't oh, really have too. a favorite, Absolutely. to be honest, but that I think they have, of the named bidders so far, either Yahoo or, or Dish, I know, has been bandied around. That might be I like I like Dish because Dish is the punk. I mean, Dish is the crazy RC Cola in this mix. Yeah. You know, they, they don't care. They got nothing to lose. Dude, uh, so they're, they're not even I, RC. I mean, I, they're Vess. Or yeah, Shasta. yeah. <laughs> There's Shasta. That's all right. <laughs> um, but uh, but regardless, I I I like Dish. I like Yahoo. And I uh, if I'm gonna decide, I'm gonna put AT and T in the like category. Not quite as much as those other guys, but at least at least at least you got somebody who will have only one interest, and that's to get us the content we want. They're in the friend zone with you. Is what you're saying? All right, sure. Let's let's go to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Actually, two stories here. One from the next web uh, about NPD's numbers showing that Netflix still dominates in TV show streaming in Q1 of 2013, but it's starting to lose ground just a little bit. Instead of being 93%, they went down to 89%. That's still pretty dominant, okay? This kind of reminds me of the iPad conversation a few years ago, though, when the iPad was like, 98% and then 93%. Everybody's like, oh, they're still dominant. Well, eventually Android caught them. This is going on with Netflix. They're now down to 89%. Hulu Plus went from 7% to 10%. Even Amazon Prime went from 1% to 2%. Long way to go between these. And, and part of that is accessibility. Netflix made a, a smart move by being everywhere. Uh, at the same time, we also have this infograph, Brian, uh, that shows average daily TV viewing in hours. And I thought what was really interesting is average monthly media viewing in hours. This is from Technology Review, MIT's website. 145 average monthly media viewing hours on television live. Not live programming, but watching without a DVR. Only 11.5 monthly media viewing in hours time shifted. And there's actually more internet viewing, 28.5 monthly media viewing in hours so more viewing on the internet than time shifted. Yeah, okay. So this is what, we'll go in reverse order. First, we'll start okay. with this one. Um, I, I think this is one of those moments when you see just how big the disconnect is from, from outliers like you and me. And yes, uh, disclaimer, me and Tom have not been able to figure out a way to make the leap to completely cutting the cord. But when I see numbers like 145 hours per month of live television watching, not time shifted, not anything, like that is astonishing to me. I would say- I would say for me personally, you're looking at maybe an hour in the entire month, full stop. I mean, and that's if you're counting when I walk in and my kids happen to be. And to be honest, I don't even know if what my kids are watching when they're watching Powerpuff Girls, if that's just what happens to be on on Boomerang or if that's or if or if it's on a DVD or what. Like, I don't even know. Uh, but as far as conscious, like I'm turning on the television to watch live television uh, I would say less than an hour per month for me. What would you put your numbers at? Now, you you like sports, though, which would change things. 
Yeah, with sports ball uh, and sports puck involved, it pro probably goes up. But let's let's bracket that off for a minute. Probably, if you don't count sports, around an hour because it would be it would be some kind of live event like a news thing uh, or a show oh, like yes, Game of Thrones be. where I like have to see it live. But even then, even then, last night I had to feed the dogs right at six o'clock. I forgot to do it earlier, so I paused. Right, so I yeah, sort of time shifted, I guess. Uh, but yeah, hour, two hours outside of sports, and then of sports, I don't know, maybe ten hours tops. It's it's okay. not that much. Uh, and keep in mind, very likely you and I are not estimating our times right, and we're forgetting oh, little I'm moments sure. like no, you're at the sure gym and there's something on in the corner or whatever. But but regardless, uh, as far as like where our hearts are and where the reality is, as far as the bulk of America, this is the story we keep hearing over and over and over again, which is don't get too excited about cutting the cord yet, bro, because the whole world still watches traditional television, and that is true. We do consume a lot of media. Uh, in a very traditional way, um, and I guess that's good for someone. It's you know, in 1968, don't get too excited about color TV, folks, because most people have black and white televisions. That's, that's a good this, point. Sounds pretty much exactly the same to me. Which okay, is, so let's, let's right step now back. the conditions are such that the dream has not been realized, but give us five, ten years, and it's going to be entirely different, now, I think. On that subject, uh, let's jump back to the MPD story. Uh, y to me, the story is uh, certainly it, it is not a surprise that Netflix is still in a dominant position. However, it is amazing that Netflix has stemmed the bleeding as much as they have because to slip only from 93% to 89%, Netflix was way, way early on this and they're making some very long-term strategy moves here. Reframe the Hulu discussion here. Hulu Plus went from 7% market share to 10% market share. That means they increased their position by 50% year over year, which is huge. Amazon Prime increased their market position by 100% year over year. Now, these are people who are also making aggressive moves, uh, more Amazon Prime than Hulu Plus. I think Hulu Plus has, uh, has just smartly positioned themselves and are settling into uh, you know, this space where it's like, look, you want to watch TV and it'll be on an iPad, just give us eight bucks a month. Whereas Amazon Prime, we're seeing a lot of moves with their uh, Amazon Originals. We're seeing a lot more of their acquisitions. In fact, Amazon Prime will mention this in the feedback segment, but like they took a, a lot of the, the Nickelodeon programming so whereas you used to be able to watch Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix, now you can only see it on Amazon Prime. Uh, I, I think this is bigger news for those number two and three networks than you would think from the way this, this graphic lays it out. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's inevitable. I don't think Netflix could keep up 93% share. I, don't, I, I just think that's absolutely ridiculous to believe and I, and I think it would be bad I think it, and we'll get to this a little more in the feedback I think we need competition I think we need multiple sources etc but uh, we'll talk about that as Brian said when we, we deal with an email a little bit later on let's take a quick break first and thank our sponsor for today's show without which we could not tell you any of these things uh, thank you Squarespace the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website a blog a portfolio or an online store Brian Squarespace does it all. Platform. Think about this, Tom. Yeah. This is in the entire history of mankind. It has never been easier to go from idea to millionaire. And it's because of stuff like Squarespace. With Squarespace, you can have a, a particular thought for a product. Let's say somebody cracks the code, right? It's some kind of enhancement to cord cutting, uh, some kind of gizmo or service or whatever. You can look 100% pro within 20 minutes just by going, setting up your website for free, they don't ask for a credit card or nothing. Once it's up, it's it's online. You go ahead and you 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 make it available to everyone. And then with whatever it is your gizmo you're selling, you use Squarespace Commerce, and then now you you're instantly available. You got money, you got a pipeline. You can play business like a video game with this kind of service. And and within months, if it's the right idea at the right time, you can be totally rich. And and we know a lot of you guys already are using Squarespace. I use Squarespace for my site. My daughter used it to make a website to save all the pandas. But there are people out there who can't think of any reason that they need Squarespace. That's fine. Just remember what they can do. Remember that you have an idea. They'll make you look good. It'll scale to all different kind of platforms, whether it's mobile, whether it's uh, your desktop computer, your laptop. They do all of that stuff automatically so you can focus on the part that matters to you, which is making money, my friends. And when that happens... You're going to sign up for free 
When you do buy it, make sure to use promo code FRAMERATE6. That's FRAMERATE, the name of the show, and the number six, considering that we're in June. And not only will you be making us look good here at FRAMERATE, but you are going to end up being a, a quadrillionaire in like 30 minutes, guaranteed, if it's the right idea. Seriously, it's, it's like, remember those people when you were young, you're like, I've got a million dollar idea. And they're like, great, you need more than an idea, son. There's this obstacle, that obstacle. It's like Squarespace just punches those people in the face yes. and they fall down I, and get out of your way. That's a great way to put it. Like, like, no, you don't need more than an idea. You just make the idea. They'll make you rich. Squarespace, yeah. trademark. <laughs> Frame rate six. Don't forget that offer code. And uh, we thank Squarespace for their support of frame rate. That's the show we're on right now. Time for the slipstream. Uh, a couple of quickies here to start off the slipstream. Hulu Plus has uh, redone their iPad interface. If you're a user of that, you should know. They now have a uh, discovery panel. I actually, you know, I'm not a Hulu Plus user myself. I keep my subscription on pause. This looks pretty nice, though. It allows you to keep playing a show in minimum on the iPad while you flip through uh, and look at other things that are available. And the discovery section shows you related shows based on your viewing history. It's pretty nifty. Yeah. This is one of those cool moments that sort of recognizes uh, the multitasking nature of the human mind nowadays, where it's like it's not enough for us to do a, a thing. We always want to be kind of yeah, searching on the periphery for what else we might could be doing at the same moment. And uh, and if they have that in that way where you can minimize it and play it and still be kind of poking around, I think that's um, – that is the one downside with mobile devices right now is that it tends to be a serial experience instead of a parallel experiment experience the way it is with uh, uh, desktops. So uh, it's good that they're acknowledging that. I haven't used it myself, uh, but I certainly haven't heard howls from the Internet uh, or on Twitter of anyone not liking it, which is always a good sign. So yeah. the, congratulations, Hulu. You pulled off you making did it. a change. Without anybody shouting Without that you suck Without off now. the internet. That's pretty yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah, it's some curated collections. that You can tap on an image of any episode, take a peek at what's inside, uh, you know, other episodes, stuff like that. So you might check it out. Also, Time Warner Cable subscribers are now allowed to watch the browser version of TWC-TV when they're not at home. It won't authenticate and go, wait a minute, are you on your home network? Doesn't do that anymore. It just says, oh, we don't care where you are. As long as you're authenticated by logging in with your username and password, uh, it's not that much. You get, what, 26 networks of on-demand programming and 11 live channels. You're, you live in a Time Warner area. Is this something you could yeah. take advantage of? No, this is a huge, huge difference because uh, just a year ago, and I'm sure you saw it on this on this show where I downloaded the TWC app and uh, I liked it a lot. It was pretty. You really could watch live television. It was like watching TV on an iPad. But the fact that it was limited to on my home Wi-Fi was just stupid. It's like if I'm at home, I'm going to watch it on TV if I want to watch it at all. Uh, the fact that for me, somebody – being on the road, always in different uh, different locations at uh, hotel Wi-Fi nationwide. Uh, this would be a very significant upgrade. Still not where I need it to be because the odds of me being available because uh, and and I guess this is true for you too, Tom. Like we do most of our content creation during primetime hours because. We have a lot of people who watch us live. In fact, right now, as we record this, it's uh, six o'clock central, seven p.m. prime time in East Coast. Uh, so as a result, you know, it's very rare that we're free to watch stuff live when it happens. And the fact that this is limited to live is a is a is a bummer. Well, no, but you've got 26, right 26 on demand channels in there. Wait, on demand? What? Yeah, twenty six on demand, eleven live. You've got almost no live frankly. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's All what right. the story well, says. Now, I haven't looked at the app itself, obviously. So you it tell says me. up to 11 live channels offering streaming content, and it says, which is modest compared to in-home use, which is, you know, 4,000 on-demand titles and 300 live TV channels. Right. And right before uh, that, it says 26 on-demand networks. To only 26 it's, with on-demand programming. All right. Well, then that's awesome then. Good, good for you. Step in the right direction. Yeah. All right. Give them that. Uh, Redbox Instant uh, is one of the up and comers in streaming business. Remember, they only do movies, but their stick is you also get DVDs from Redbox if you live near a Redbox box in front of your local convenience store. Uh, this summer, coming to Roku, that's big news for Roku fans, and also uh, available for Google TV. So if you have one of those two boxes by the end of the summer, you'll be able to watch Redbox. In fact, I think the Redbox Instant is now available on Google TV. 
This is actually very smart because Redbox Instance looks to most people like a Me Too Netflix clone. And and it is. But by position, but the fact that they have red boxes, you know, outside of every McDonald's, outside of your CVS pharmacies and so on, uh, they essentially are able to say, and this is the marketing hype, whether or not it's true, it's up to you. They're essentially able to say, what if you had the complete Netflix experience so you could download certain titles instantly uh, without without even leaving the house, but you didn't have to wait for the next day or two days for a physical disc to arrive if you want one of those titles. So uh, this is this is good news that they're that they're securing their position. And I'm not sure whether this is good news or bad news. I'm going to take advantage of it and try it out. But Voodoo has expanded their disk to digital home ultraviolet conversion software to Mac. And they've entered public beta before you had to be invited in. Now anybody can try it out. Uh, between now and August 31st, if you're a Voodoo member, which doesn't mean you pay for Voodoo, it just means you've signed up, uh, you can get one free disk converted. And every disk after that is, I think, around $2. This is taking something that I feel like you ought to have the fair use right to do on your own, but they're also adding value. They're not just converting. What they're doing is they're using Grace Note to identify the DVD and go, okay, that's what movie that is, and then adding an ultraviolet license to that movie so that you can get it from the ultraviolet service in other places. For You can download it to your iOS or Android device because Vudu now allows you to download movies from the app to your device. So I've mixed feelings about this, Brian. I think it's actually a really good service. It, and I think it's priced right because if what you want to do, yes, you have the legal right to take your existing copies of your DVDs and back them up in a way that's easy for you to access and put them on your computer. So you can for free take your time, put discs in, convert them, rip them, store them on your uh, I, I don't know about the ripping bar because you're breaking encryption for that. I, don't, I forget where the, live, the legal side of things are. But from a practical standpoint, you can physically do all of this and you can do it for free. And if you have a library of 100 titles, let's say, then then you can spend no money. And after, you know, five days of effort, you can end up with everything archived on your own personal server. This offers significant upgrades. If it's a Blu-ray, keeps it in HD and it's instant. You just pop it in. It just reads the, uh, uh, you know, the identifier on the disk, it unlocks it, makes it available. Also cloud storage, which means you can get to it um, easier. Uh, and on multiple devices, I think that's worth two bucks per Blu-ray. And I think it's worth a $5 upgrade on DVD. Uh, my guess is nobody's going to back up their whole library, though. My guess is you're going to pick like, what are the three movies that I just yeah. wish were always on tap? Essentially, you're, you're buying a, a movie tap and you can pick those. And for like 20, 50 bucks or whatever, you can have those few movies that you wish were always available on all of your devices. And I also wonder how many movies people are going to run into. Oh, this is not available for Voodoo disc to digital conversion because we don't have the oh, license to that, that for sure. Yeah, that, that's going to happen. I'm already thinking like I would like to take my Casablanca DVD because it's like sometimes available on iTunes for purchase, but sometimes not. Uh, and I'm like, dude, I would, I wanted that. That's going to be the free one. I'm going to take that. But then I'm like, well, wait a minute. Is it going to be available? Is there, are they going to have the license to do that? Cause well, the license he, is so weird digitally. Here's the other thing. Like I got annoyed with the fact that I can't show the Incredibles to my daughter on any kind of digital device. Like, you know, you buy, if you buy something used, if you buy a used DVD, you're sort of trapped in this analog, you know, yeah. meat space block and you can't put it on your iPad or whatever. But it's like, this would be a perfect situation. I would love to spend, you know, just five bucks, throw in a DVD, boom, it's now HD available on all my devices in the cloud. That would be huge. So have you, have you been doing the push-ups thing, the crazy Russian push-ups thing? Do you feel... You feel confident I, I about? For, I did for about two weeks, and then and okay. then now I'm off. I'm going to do it again in a bit. Well, I'm just wondering because I'm going to ask you to put on tube tops now. <laughs> Not where I thought you were headed with that. That was very impressive. <laughs> it's it's rare that you can surprise me so well, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> After this many years, it takes some work on my end. Believe me. Uh, Sony's Google TV box gets a refresh. The NSZGS8 replaces the snappily named NSZGS7. Uh, and the big deal is they've added a, a mic here so you can take advantage of the Google TV voice search and voice control options. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of the same. A little, little bump up in specs, $199 and should reach stores by early July. 
So we've already talked about how we were disappointed. We were excited about the promise of Google TV, but uh, the realities of distribution deals and so on have have kind of, um, you know, neutered aspects of it that we really like. However, there is one thing that I am deeply, deeply in love with, which is uh, that this remote control. Throw that back on there, Jason. That is just it may be my favorite remote control I've ever seen, and I've never touched one. I've never used it, but it just looks like it's from the freaking future and does everything I want it to do. And now that you could talk to it, that would be amazing. Computer? Hello, computer? <laughs> <laughs> but we're kind of burying hey, the boom, tube top transparent sleeve. aluminum. Uh, Microsoft announces Xbox One price, $499, launches in 21 countries in November and available for pre-order today. They had their big uh, uh, E3 announcement this morning. Really, uh, it was all about video games, as it should be at E3. So it's not like we have a lot of frame rate oriented stuff to add to this but now that we know the price as an entertainment box not just video games but also the television stuff we've talked about previously the ability to control your cable box uh, the ability to get netflix and hulu plus and all that stuff do they, do they have hulu plus wait am i remembering that right i think they do uh 499 dollars brian you you good with that i am I am. First of all, I, I think now that I've seen kind of the second half of the Xbox announcement, it makes me forgive their their bold decision to essentially not really focus on games at all during the initial announcement. Uh, we are still waiting to hear about stuff like DVR capabilities, but let's say for sake of discussion that it does have decent DVR capabilities that it can control and integrate with your cable box. Once you Once that factors into the pricing, all of a sudden you're able to to eliminate other devices and justify the hefty early investment fee. Uh, the biggest announcement that they made, I thought, was the fact that, uh, yes, you'll still have to pay for Xbox Live Gold memberships, but the fact that now Xbox Live Gold memberships comes with two free uh, AAA titles per month for you to download is huge. All of a sudden, it, 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 you're able to lay out and say, hey, man, if you were to buy these titles separately, it would, essentially Xbox Live Gold becomes the HBO of video games, where after games come out, after they have their big run where they're getting sold for 60 bucks a pop, then they kind of enter this like, oh, yeah, I never did play Halo 3 market. And it becomes, you know, quote unquote free with your Xbox Live Gold membership. I think that they're very, very well positioned. I think we're all going to look right past that $4.99 uh, price tag. But they aren't going to allow you to pick those two free a month. That's just... No, no that's, that's, just that's too, why I say it's yeah. like the HBO experience yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's like they're the ones who secure the deals. Yeah. But you'll know that reliably because uh, I think they said Assassin's Creed 3 and Halo 3 were going to be the first titles out there, which I think, again, I think it's smart. It's a niche that nobody has fulfilled. It takes Brian, something that was starting to look like a liability and makes it a benefit. This is my point. It's video games that make this attractive. And that's great. And I think maybe it's overpriced, maybe it's not. I think that's an argument you can have. I think $499 is not outrageous for a video game player who wants to play video games, is going to subscribe to Xbox Live already. All this TV stuff they get extra is just bonus, uh, and that makes it worthwhile. If I'm coming to it from the perspective of, eh, I could care less one way or another about video games. I like video games, but that's not why I'm buying it. It's too much. It's too expensive. And so you're not going to expand the Xbox One at this point into the other arenas and make it a more massively appealing device. I think Microsoft will be able to do that later if they add other features to this, such as a DVR type feature or an ability to get, say, the Intel service directly over the internet or some other service like that. But right now, for a frame rater who's not a video gamer, I don't think this is the box. Not when you can get a Roku or an Apple TV for 99 bucks or less. Yes, I agree with all of that, probably, but uh, but also, <laughs> I mean, but but I mean, I I can't possibly be fair about this because I am in love with everything I've seen. I thought their presentation was really good today. Yeah, well, you were, you were the guy that this is I think is targeted squarely at, which is yeah, well, I love playing video games. I mean, I'm not a hardcore; it's my life, professional video gamer. I love playing video games, so I want this box, and it's awesome that it does all this other stuff too. I, I think Microsoft, rightly so, is going to sell a lot of xbox ones to to that that crowd i agree ordered one myself agreed agreed let's move on to film film <laughs> so
So uh, I, we missed this. I, I don't think we talked about this, but there was a short film kicking around called Raha, which was created uh, by, oh, man, I, I, I've lost the name now, but it was not McCallum. It was not Rick McCallum, but it's now being turned into a movie produced by Rick McCallum. 22-year-old Caleb Lakowski made the six-minute short about an alien uh, captured by a robot that is trying to get information about him. And it's so good and so well done that Lucasfilm McCallum, he's no longer with Lucasfilm, and uh, the guy from Star Wars Clone Wars, producer Steve Zerlin, want to turn it into a motion picture. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, you're right. We didn't feature it on frame rate, but I remember I put this on my Google Plus and, and pimped the hell out of it because, of course, the the thing that's amazing is you got a 22-year-old kid with, uh, with you know, soft nothing but a uh, average desktop who puts nothing but time, creativity, and love into it. And it's this amazing Vimeo short. We'll put it in the show notes that is full on from beginning to end, uh, not only – not only uh, AAA movie quality production, but but AAA quality movie storytelling, and it's very simple. It's not it's not the most elegant story or whatever, but but it's gorgeous and and it exploded virally despite the fact that there was no human in the whole thing. This is the story of a battle between some alien creature and the rogue um, the the rogue machines that they're fighting against. Uh, that's a very sophisticated move for him to make. And it came out looking really, really good. It doesn't surprise me that it got, you know, nabbed up. It, it's, it does a little bit bum me out that the reason this got picked up was not for having a completely novel or unique story. It got picked up because some really talented 22-year-old made an amazing demo reel that looked like a movie and someone somewhere shrugged their shoulders and Rick McCallum shrugged his shoulders and like, yeah, dude, that'll make millions. Let's go. Um, so, I mean, good, good on you for that. Good on you for that. But, but, but don't, I mean, you watch it and you, you'll see that the story is not the, the, the heavy hitting benefit to it. It's, it's really extraordinary execution. That, that I think you're this. right, but I, I think it hints at a pretty fun and cool story because it's an alien and a robot, right? Sure, I mean, sure. Oh, no, that's, no, there's all kinds different. of places that that, that they, this can't go. That they but, drop but, a lot of hints just, about where it can go. Yeah, yeah. All right. uh, HBO's next big TV series, uh, according to io9, The Spark will be all about aliens as well. Uh, it is a uh, hi, HBO has hired the Last Resort producer and co-writer of the Oblivion script, Carl Gajasek, and I apologize, Carl, if I mispronouncing your last name. Uh, Deadline describes it as set in a world undergoing a technological industrial revolution in the near future when contacted by a signal from beyond the solar system. It centers on the human reaction to a mystery still spiritually and technologically out of reach and follows a female protagonist as she works on the cusp of the Earth's effort to discover the origin of the signal. Now, they're sort of describing it as, well, they've done... Game of Thrones, and they've done True Blood. So what what they've done for vampires and castles and dragons, they're not going to do for aliens. I'm okay with that. Not wrong with that, that bro. ends up being true, I'm all for that. Absolutely. Yeah, man. No, everything about that sounds good. And that you know what? The description, though, it sounded a little like um, I hate to say this, but uh, the uh, the Alien prequel. Um, oh, uh, Prometheus. Yeah. Dude, uh, if they could deliver on the promise that Prometheus yeah, totally okay. bought, yeah. I'm totally fine with that, bro. It's good by me. Deliver on the promise. I like your optimism. Uh, Netflix's new big original is coming July 11th. Orange is the new black. It is a dramedy. Although, frankly, when I watched the trailer, it was a lot more drama than Medi uh, about a woman who is living a beautiful life, but a, an old crime comes back to haunt her and she gets sent to jail uh, and she has to learn how to live in this new reality. We uh, they, they've released the trailer. You can look at it. There there are some funny bits because you know she's obviously not of the crime world, even though she committed this one crime. Does it look good to you, Brian? Yeah, I liked it an awful lot, and I was surprised at how much I like it because it didn't pull any punches and it didn't. Uh, you could easily do this and make everything a joke, but instead. They, it looks like they're putting some real heart in there, and there's going to be some real shocking moments. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. It, it uh, we'll see. We'll see. I'm very optimistic on it. And again, 
you got to grade it on the curve. Like, full stop, I, I'd be interested. If you told me this was on Showtime, I would definitely check it out. But the fact that, again, this is another Netflix original, they got me all excited, and Netflix is putting themselves in a different category of, of online content producer with, with more of this stuff. It looks really good. Yeah, and uh, it is from Genji Kohan of Showtime's Weeds fame. So there's a little showtime lineage in there as well also reading a bunch of articles about in the flesh bbc's uh zombie drama a lot of comparison to walking dead in fact uh wired has bbc's in the flesh is the thinking person's walking dead but it's not walking dead at all it's not fighting the zombies the idea is that they find out that zombies can be rehabilitated uh and they are prescribed with something called partially deceased syndrome and it's about their reintegration into society, the prejudices against them for being a PDS, and them remembering the things that they had done when they were zombies, which are awful. Love this. Love this idea. Loved what I saw of the trailers. The first three minutes are available, I think, on BBC's website. Uh, and you could tell what it's opening up is that an awful lot of this, the undercurrent of all this, is the, the existential agony of of what it means to be a zombie or partially deceased or you know we we um and I'm sure in this world what they would think of as hurtful stereotypes you know the whole thing is a thinly veiled allegory for the way we handle people with uh, schizophrenia and and all kinds of uh terrible mental diseases we we they end up on the fringes now that that here in America you know it's against the law to commit them to uh, to sanatoriums against their will. So as a result, we have a lot of homeless people with a lot of uh, diseases and uh, you know you know mental diseases. What what's the yeah. word I'm trying to think of? Mental illness. Sorry. Mental illness. Uh, and yeah. uh, and to to frame it in that way, I think that they could do a lot of good with this. And and what might look on the surface like a silly or cute science fiction idea could be a place to uh to make really important arguments about social change in reality uh finally in film film anyway uh morphin apg on reddit has posted a link to a mega download where he has taken the entire run of arrested development from netflix and recut it in chronological order so if you were curious how the story would play out if told from beginning to end without the flashbacks without the intercuts you can go watch it and uh, the lead editor Kabir Ashtar of Arrested Development during a Reddit AMA uh, said that this sounds really interesting. He's like, you know, I'd like to check it out. I'm really interested to see how they all look when put back together because the penthouse scene, for example, was originally shot and cut as one giant scene. And once it was distributed to different episodes, as it had been intended, each part changed separately. So I never got to watch it all together again. So this is one of the weird things. Like, like early on, Netflix said... We want, you know, we'll have a suggested viewing order, but we look forward to other people suggesting different orders to watch all of the videos. And they ended up pulling back from that a little bit. And they, you know, it's very clear that they're arranging certain things to be revealed as, as you move forward. But like Netflix's stated goal was we want to see people essentially remix the Arrested Development experience. Unfortunately, the legal framework is such that this guy had to illegally rip all the episodes. He had to break encryption to do it. He had to remix. Then he tried to put it up in a distribution platform so that people could watch it. Certainly couldn't post it on Netflix for anyone else to see. So he put it up on Mega where they got a takedown notice, whether it was automatic or from Netflix. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. But like Netflix has flatly said, we want other people to, uh, to suggest their way to experience this. Someone did it and the structure, the legal framework immediately yeah. shut it down, which is a real well, shame. Well, Netflix is like, we want people to suggest the order to watch them on Netflix, is what they really mean. Sure, say, and, and yeah. what a shame that what a shame that there's no framework to easily post this stuff. Netflix is not YouTube, but if Netflix were to open their little YouTube-like experience uh, as, as a subdomain in there, uh, that could be huge, but unfortunately there's not enough, you know, uh, that might work for a specifically Netflix-owned property that they give permission to remix and upload remixes on. But it wouldn't work for the vast amount of non-Netflix-owned content well, and, out there, which is a real And even shame. then, it would be difficult for Netflix because the DMCA says it's illegal to circumvent copyright protection. And so they would have to give people special tools that make it clear that they're not circumventing copyright protection, which means they couldn't have the freedom to do what this guy did, which is just capture all the footage 
edit it on his machine and upload it, which means people are not going to do it. So oh, it's, it's, it's it a, is an exi- you know, the law does get in your way, even if you want to allow people to do things. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is one of the more stark experiences where clearly Netflix has said we want people to curate and, and experiment with the way to experience our rested development content. And people clearly want to do it. This guy did it. The editor says, I'd love to see it. But all of it has to be illegal and shut down because of stupid frameworks that we're dealing with right now. Makes me howl like a wolf. Not me. It makes me punch old ladies. Experience. Let's move on to the movie draft. It is me in last place in the summer movie draft. <laughs> uh, but let's not look at the past. Let's look at the internship, which only did seventeen million this past weekend for Sarah Lane. Ow! Uh, yeah, I really expected okay. that to do better. I mean, she didn't spend it's that a, much on it, so it's not not as bad for her, I don't think. Yeah, Sarah only spent seventeen dollars, which means that she would like it to see over a, a hundred million dollars plus uh, in order to hit the realm of you know winning territory. But keep in mind, Sarah, this is Sarah's third pick. Her first two were exceptional. She spent spent seventeen dollars on The Great Gatsby, netting her eight million dollars per buck. She also spent uh, ten dollars on Now You See Me. Now You See Me is already at sixty million, which means it's six million dollars per buck. So. Um, this is her first misstep. It's not. It's not a deal killer because it's only seventeen of her hundred bucks spent on it. Uh, you know, I, I. I. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not counting Sarah out. Uh, your situation, Tom. What does your gut tell you? Are you totally out of it based on how After Earth tanked, or do you? No, you, I'm do gonna, you have a chance? I, I, I will know whether I'm wholly out of it by the end of June. Here's why. This weekend. And for those of you who just don't like the movie draft part of it, here's the content for you. This is the end. Cargill's movie and Man of Steel, Justin Robert yep. Young's movie come out. That's going to be Justin Robert Young's telling moment. He's in a good position in second place and Man of Steel should do well. Then we've got Monsters University, which is my movie, which is one of those ones that doesn't get the attention of the blockbusters, but it's Pixar, it's kids, it's going to do really well. And then following on that, World War Z, Sarah's movie is getting really good reviews. I don't think people expected it to do as well as maybe it will. White House down for Cargill, and then uh, at the end of the month, along with The Heat, which is Sandra Bullock comedy, which I think is going to do better than the $11 I spent on it. So I think by the end of this month, we'll have a really good idea of what has to happen for anyone to challenge you, Brian, because you're way out in front with Iron Man, uh, and, and whether that's even possible and, and what, or what kind of scenarios will play out. I think right now the picture is still a little murky. Uh, yeah, what I'm seeing right now, if I was going to guess, um, and it, it's a coin toss on whether or not one of yours was a, is a runaway. If one of yours is a runaway, then then yeah, you're back in it. But right now, it looks like a two-man race between me and Justin because uh, Justin did really well with Epic and Fast and Furious 6. He's only got two movies left, but man, are they heavy hitters. Uh, the Man of Steel looks amazing. Uh, I can easily see it being a $400 million movie. If it is then Justin has a chance to run away with this thing and win. The Smurfs exactly. 2 could be a $200 million movie. Um, I'm not out of juice here, but, uh, you know, because I got Despicable Me 2 coming up and Grown Ups 2 and, and The World's End. World's End, I don't think is going to make any money, but it doesn't matter. Um, man, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. I got Wolverine uh, and Planes say- coming up later this year, too. So, Oh, that's right. You got Planes. I'm not planes. out could win it for you. Ah, um, I would, I, that's, that's strong language, Brian, but. Okay. Uh, Cargill, Cargill, by the way, uh, made a mistake with the hangover part three, totally died. This is the end though. Could be yeah. this, this decade hangover. Yeah. I mean, it could be, it could be really, really huge. Uh, oh, people are asking why the purge wasn't in the list. The purge, was not expected to be nearly as big as it turned out to be. A horror movie at the beginning of the summer was not anticipated to make a lot of money. Instead, uh, it costs like nothing to make, and it's a big, big story that it uh, it turns out to outperform. It was the number one at the box yeah. office. Uh, so congratulations to those guys. So those of you who wrote in uh, three months ago and said you have to have the purge in the summer movie draft, we apologize to you. Everybody else shut up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, let's you want to uh, talk about what we're watching. Yeah, let's do. What we're watching. 
obviously Game of Thrones, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but otherwise, you're just doing your shield catch up. Is that it? Yeah. Well, uh, you know what? It's it's one of those things where it's like uh, at at around eleven o'clock after Bonnie's gone to bed. And I want to do other stuff, but I'm tired of giving my full attention to anything. And I just want something else happening. I've started to put on the shield to see, you know, because having already experienced it's really just a refresher. Man, it still still holds up. If you have Amazon Prime, join me, man. You've heard Jeff Kanata call it the best show ever made. Uh, uh, dive in and, and choose for yourself. If you like Breaking Bad, you will like The Shield. Breaking right. Bad and The Shield are the exact same stories told in inverse directions. Gotcha. I also uh, have have did that with Futurama, where I just rewatched everything because I wanted something that I knew I would enjoy. Uh, and I caught up on Warehouse 13 recently. Did it in an interesting way, by the way, because video, do you remember the video service? It's still out there sure, sure. From, from the RDO guys. They gave you $25 free credit. I got the email saying, hey, your credit's going away. So I bought, I had just enough money to buy all the episodes of Warehouse 13 with my credit that I hadn't seen yet. Uh, and then transitioned to watching the rest on the DVR. And the video service worked great. In fact, the best experience was watching it on the video app on iPad and airplaying yep. it to Apple TV. It looked beautiful. Uh, in fact, I was really disappointed when I caught up to the DVR because then I had to fast forward through commercials again. But um, uh, that that's my experience with Doctor Who, man. I couldn't handle switching to the BBC America thing. I really regret it. I mean, yeah. I think that might be the biggest reason I fell off on watching Doctor Who is the the weird breaks just shoved in with ads that didn't match the tone at all was driving me nuts just so people know i'm still watching defiant still watching mad men uh my nephew is staying with me for a couple months this summer he's in college so uh he has been introducing us to the in-betweeners which i've been recommended to me many a time uh but he just put it on and started playing it hilarious uh british high school age comedy and tucker and dale versus evil have you seen that are you kidding me? I totally talked up this this movie like a year ago, and you were Did just you like, really? "Oh, that's Did nice, Brian." Get this? Yes, dude. Okay, I, I, I apologize. You are absolutely right, then, because this is probably one of the most brilliant horror movies I've ever seen. Yes, it is amazing, dude. Tucker, Tucker Dale versus Evil. Uh, yes, there's moments of black comedy in there where it's like you know you get you're gonna see a lot of blood and guts, and it's it's oh, riffing on the horror genre. If you liked Cabin in the Woods and its self aware kind of meta take on things. Tucker and Dale versus Evil is, I'm going to use this word. Tell me if it's too much. I found it adorable. I loved it. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's actually a pretty good word. Not the only word, but a very good word to apply to this. Uh, I also watched 10 minutes of the movie Rubber. What, what did you see about that? What, what it's, about is rubber tire. Rubber? it's about a tire that kills know. people. <laughs> really? Is that for real? Yeah, it's <laughs> on Netflix. Beach. Go check it out. See how long you last. Uh, <laughs> Take the rubber <laughs> challenge. <laughs> if you can speech. defeat Tom Merritt, we'll send you a frame rate T-shirt as, as soon as we make one. <laughs> Someday when we make that. <laughs> Let's move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate. Oh, yeah. Our first one comes from Shaw. His last name... Really? No, I'm not going to say that, Shaw. Uh, hi, last episode, you spoiled a part of the movie Star Trek Into Darkness. This was annoying to me because the movie hasn't premiered here yet. My point is you shouldn't spoil anything until the whole world has a chance to see it. Uh, may, may, I, may I take this on behalf of both of us, yeah, Tom? Sure. Hi, Shaw. I'm Brian Brushwood from Framerate. A lot of people get upset of us because of our talk about spoilers. Let me just say... Screw you. We're not going to play this game anymore. We'll say what we want, when we want, how we want it. And if you don't like it, go watch some other show. Out. And, and, and we'll try to, to be careful most of the time. But we can't keep track of release dates of everything everywhere. It's just... I, I don't know what to do anymore, Brian. I'm with it's, you. It's reality. It's reality, yeah. bro. Go pound I, Sam I, if you got I a problem with I apparently spoiled this. Justin, Robert Young, and Veronica's night last night with an innocent text message. I had no idea. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, actually, Spoilers. you did. <laughs> uh, James from the UK says, I was just watching a gentle walkthrough for a game called Dreamfall Longest Journey, and an advert for Saints Row 4 came on, which is 18, rated in the UK. Do you know what Google's policy on adverts is? Is it really appropriate to have an 18-rated advert on YouTube? I had moderate filtering on my device. I don't tend to leave my child in front of YouTube, but seeing as you can't skip adverts, this one was using an F word within a few seconds. F word in the advert? Was that? 
That's I'm weird. surprised by that. Now, now here's the thing, and and this is something. This is ongoing, and I will uh, report in on it. But for the first time, we're taking one of our older laptops and we're setting it up in the kids' game room. And I plan to totally try to kidify it so that Penelope will be able to, you know, travel around YouTube without getting totally ruined. Uh, I know that there are parental controls you can enable in YouTube that aren't very well known. That do things like, for example, they uh, they disable all the content or, or comments on YouTube, so you don't have to see all the f bombs that uh, all the trolls love to uh, to to post. By the way, I just <laughs> I just saw what got written down. That was very difficult for me to keep talking during uh, the. Uh, uh, but but anyway, I will report in on this. Uh, if my guess is is that you don't have parental controls turned on in YouTube, and by default, you know when someone's paying the ads, they're able to write whatever they want. And then Matt Marr is upset because Viacom, as he as he puts it, I think this is pretty good, moved their stuff out of Netflix's apartment and into Amazon's. And now it's the only place he can watch Avatar The Last Airbender. He says, I know it's usually the nerd rage reaction to hate change, but there's really nothing good about this from the consumer point of view. I'm a Netflix and Prime member, but I never watch anything on Prime. I don't watch long form video on my desktop or laptop. And Amazon Prime Instant Video simply has an awful interface Everywhere I've used it. The TiVo UI pretty much lists every video in their collection alphabetically. The Google TV UI basically just opens a browser to their web page. And Amazon simply doesn't have an instant video app for Android because they've kept it exclusive for Kindle Fire. And he says, this is why Netflix is winning. They have a good interface and they're on everything. So here's the weird part. Yes, I agree that Amazon's interface is not ideal. But they do one thing I think that is extraordinarily smart. When you want to watch something on Amazon Prime, the way I do it is I go to Amazon, I search for the, the show. For example, as I watch The Shield, every time I sit down and I go to the store of Amazon and I type in The Shield and they say, oh, you want The Shield? Here they are. Here's six, seven seasons, however many there are. And I walk over and I thumb through and I pick the episode I want. And I pull it out and I say, how much for this episode? And they say, well... You can choose to pay $1.99 for standard definition, $2.99 for high definition, or you can have it for free because you're an Amazon Prime member. Like something about that makes me happy every stupid time I click play on it. Yes, it's extra steps, but I think from a, uh, from a marketing perspective as this reminder that you're part of a secret club that gets stuff for free now – I think it's really smart, question mark. And keep and in mind, Amazon Prime, we just saw 100% year-over-year growth. So they're doing something right. Uh, so I, I I don't know. I'm I, not- and, I, and I think competition is good. It's When he says it's not good from a consumer point of view, granted, Amazon's interface is not up to snuff with Netflix. Its accessibility is not up to snuff with Netflix. But Netflix had a huge head start. I would assume Amazon is going to get better at this over time. Look at Kindle. The Kindle interface was horrid. When the Kindle first launched and you could only get it on the Kindle. And now they have apps for everything and the interface is quite good in my opinion. So Amazon knows how to do this. It's just going to take them time to get out there. A Roku interface isn't bad. It's not perfect, but it's probably one of their better interfaces. You can you can you get to things a lot more easily in that interface, I feel like. Yeah. Right on, man. Well, don't forget, if you guys want to chime in, just write us at fr at twit.tv or frameratereshow at gmail.com. I guess that's it for this episode. We'll move it to the, to the spoiler zone, Tom. And yeah, if you're not going to be spoiled by Game of Thrones, we'll see you next time. Bye. Um, okay, first of all, to explain the whole how I spoiled everyone, Justin Robert Young sends this note out. Ten minutes before Game of Thrones starts on the East Coast feed, which I get on DirecTV, and says, how do we think this episode's going to end? One, two, okay, three, and, and four. Specifically, he starts laying down bookmakers' odds. Exactly. On all no, of this. This, is, it's, it's great. This is fun. He sends it to, to me and Brian and Veronica. And so... I'm going through this. Is, I'm having a great time. I'm like, okay, yeah, I think it might be this. And we're learning, we're teaching each other about exactas and, and beating the spread and all, having all this fun stuff, right? So then everything goes quiet in this conversation as Game of Thrones starts. So in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, everybody's watching the show now. 
So I watch the show. And at the end, I say we all lose because none of the four proposed endings actually happen in the show. Correct. And, uh, Veronica immediately screams at me in all caps. Okay. Well, it's, it's so, it's so well, and keep in mind, I did the same thing. Hold on. Uh, she, she says, uh, she, <laughs> she, you say Visual we all belt. lose. Oh, you, you says, gotta show her cursing. You're showing her cursing on there. I don't know if oh, she sorry, it. sorry. But there, there we go. Then she shows the table flipping thing and Tom's yeah. like, I didn't tell you anything. Uh, and regardless. Honestly, in, re in, in, re in retrospect, there were four things that happened in the books that this show, in the first 10 minutes, you're like, well, none of those things can happen. Maybe one of them could still happen, but probably not. Like, you just no, you, know you, they're you not going. You didn't spoil anything, but, 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 and first of all, what you did was fair game because you were under the impression that we were all watching it together. And that was an and appropriate was time of place to do it. That was sure. the only thing. I, I was like, oh, I forgot that Comcast stupidly doesn't give you the East Coast feed. And so she can't watch it until later. And then again, okay. not everybody, whatever. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk about this. But, uh, yeah. Did this not feel like a season finale? Because I didn't think it did. Well, first of all, understand this is HBO's MO ever since The Wire. And this Justin and I, last night, we did our sure. podcast for the two of us uh, where, where we spent an hour talking about this. You know, with The Wire, they really started making um, uh, the next to last episode the big moment in each season and the final episode was always an epilogue and as an epilogue this was extraordinary it was it was setting the table for next for next year i i thought that every single interaction was fantastic i am deeply in love with watching the hound and aria do do their thing and aria getting harder and harder core um i thought the reunion of of a defeated uh demoralized um uh, what's his name? Uh, having sex with Cersei. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, Jamie coming back to King's Landing was huge. I thought that um, uh, even though, again, a lot of departures from what's happening in the books, but in many ways keeping very much with the spirit of it, the fact that they sort of let Gendry go because in the books Gendry wasn't uh, – it didn't happen that way. Gendry just sort of went off and did his own thing. The fact that they arranged an escape for him, so he's out of the storyline now. I think that's a uh, spoiler, frankly. I think that's a spoiler that Gendry's going to show up in one of the books that Martin hasn't written yet. Because Martin has told be these guys how the books are going to play out. Yeah, no, no, no. That and that would be very, very Martin for him for him to do, and and that's fine. Uh, I think that the moment of tenderness between, uh, also not in the book, uh, great moment of tenderness between Tyrion and um, and Sansa, yeah, uh, yeah. especially the fact that it was right in front of of Tyrion's whore. Uh, Shay. The, right, she uh, has yes, a name. Shay. Her name is Shay. <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, I think that uh, rise uh, up here, Brian. The moment. Uh, the moment. Where they, uh, where Varys tries to pay off Shay for the good of the realm or whatever. Uh, again, not in the books, but for how they've written everything so far to simplify things, made a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, across the board, it was like there was not one. I, I would say weirdly, and I'm shocked to say this, weirdly, the weakest scene, the weakest vignette in the whole episode was uh, was Daenerys. Just walking out oh. and getting high fives from all the and, slaves. And that's probably like, where, and, and doing a little crowd surfing. I, yeah. I think that's where I have my reaction that this just felt like a, a very bad season finale. And I get what you're saying about The Wire, but The Wire was constructed that way on purpose. It was, it was a different story in the same universe with the same characters. And I never, when I was watching The Wire, felt that that was wrong. It always felt like an epilogue. Like, okay, that was the big deal. And now the epilogue, whereas with this and maybe it's once again, I've read the books and so it's muddying me. I felt like it was just another episode. And like you say, all of the individual scenes, except for the last one, were very satisfying. It didn't feel like it really set me up for the next season, even though it literally did all the table setting that you're talking about. And, and we talked about this actually ourselves afterwards. It puts together all of these things for next season, but none of us felt like we were really like excited to see what was going to happen next. It felt like we needed another episode for that. And and ending on the White Walkers walking south, ending on the dragons yes. showing up, those were crazy dramatic endings. This crowd surfing bit, I'm not sure worked that well. Uh, okay, well, the, the one thing that the crowd surfing bit did do was give a big visual to what should be a big part of Daenerys' story. The, the, the fact that last episode, we just see three guys go off and then come back and be like, 
City's yours, bro. Like, without any big visual was unsatisfying to me last episode. They finally paid out on it this episode. Sure. And I understand. You only have so many pieces. You got to arrange them in some kind of way to create it. You needed some kind of big visual at the end of this episode. So they decided to have, you know, the freed slaves come out and praise Daenerys. I understand all that. And I forgive all of that. Um, the, uh, man, I, 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 I'm, I, I agree that there wasn't as big of a promise as we got in previous seasons. However, I'm going to say that the Red Wedding delivered so very well uh, that that it offsets any kind of, of lesser lesser twist in the epilogue. Like, I mean, it's, ugh, it's, does that make sense? I mean, I mean, g- g- um, I would say the Red Wedding, the Red Wedding was bigger than Ned Stark's beheading because Ned Stark's beheading is in the first season. You think it's about this guy. Surprise, it's not about this guy. You're like, wow, what a great twist to get me engaged. Then you spend right. three full seasons thinking you know the story and then to be told, oh, by the way, everything you've been thinking for the last uh, for the last three, five years, totally wrong. That's not the story either. That can feel like a huge betrayal. So I don't mind that they sort of had this zen kind of cleansing <clears throat> table setting experience for the last episode because it was also all very well done. I mean, I loved, I, I loved the, every interview. The, the more we talk, the more I feel like I would have ended on a different scene and then I would have felt more satisfied because you're right. I, I, I liked seeing Jon Snow uh, dragged into the, to the castle black. I, I liked the stuff with Arya uh, and killing her first person. I liked all of those scenes. I actually even liked the Daenerys scene. I just didn't like it as the last scene. I, picked a particular scene in that text message thread and i think that could have been an amazing way to uh, have a dramatic I think, I think that ending that doesn't spoil anything it just it does spoil something but it, it would have been an easy way to say like hey there's some there's some crazy stuff coming next next yeah. time which is you what the what? white walkers and the dragons did this didn't say there's crazy stuff coming it's like ooh daenerys won right this is the uh, yeah, you picked uh, lady stoneheart I, right I, I, that doesn't mean anything to anyone who hasn't read the books. I sure, they, sure it's a you say that. Oh, we already we have people writing right now to say that. Anyway, hey, um, we gave a warning in the feedback segment. We made it very clear. Yeah, but this is a spoiler zone. of the TV zone, not a spoiler of the book zone. Okay, but okay, those words that don't mean anything. That's what you picked, uh, and 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 then that way, if you've read the book and those words mean something to you, you're on the same page as us. Uh, I actually agree with you because that would have been in line with how the other seasons ended. It would have been after a season of largely non supernatural events, a significant supernatural event. That's a really good point. That's uh, yeah. I, I'm on your side now. They, they and, could and that could have been make- something that sort of lingers for the for the first few episodes before you even have to go back to it. You know? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, it could it could be like that moment, like the eyes open. Oh, that would have been pretty good. Yeah. Huh. That. All that, right. Wow. Well, okay. Now, first of all, 100%, you're right, Tom. But having said that, I was still extraordinarily satisfied with this episode. Extraordinarily satisfied. Like, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. I wish I could unknow the books. I just want to experience. In fact, part of me wonders if I'll even read the last couple of books when they come out. Because if I have the oh, option oh, of just experiencing. I will. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I what have a different thoughts, philosophy Tom? on it too, but yeah. What are the that's, odds? That's strong. That's strong. That's a bold, bold statement. What are the odds, Tom? That if we're talking about bookmakers' odds, what are the odds that Game of Thrones, the TV series, finishes before Game of Thrones, the book series, happens? I don't think he lets that happen. I don't think George think- Martin lets that happen. Here's what I think, and I, I have no no evidence to back this up. I think if. I think he gets the next book out before he needs to and just in time uh, for them to be able to to be on target. And then I think season seven of Game of Thrones, which they said we're, we're only going to do seven seasons, isn't the last book. I think they do a movie. Seven seasons in a movie, huh? That's the HBO way. Entourage is going to do a freaking movie. Sex in the City movie. I, that- I can see it. That would be epic and huge. Okay, if they don't do a movie, what? How much money does HBO pay George R. R. Martin to <laughs> let 
Just just wait another year. Just wait another year. Sit on that. Here's right, here's right. ten million dollars yeah, yeah. to just not release it and let this be the way the world experiences the ending to the story. Yeah, I don't. I and I, as a book reader, I don't know if I want to do that. Oh, <laughs> dude, but I would love it just to watch the whole I, world erupt into rage. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. That that would be fun to watch for sure. All right. Uh, are we good with the spoiler zone? Yeah, we're totally good. There was a good spoiler zone. I feel like we spoiled a lot today. That, yeah, we did. We spoiled the crap out of everybody. So thank That's you good. all for sticking yeah. around. Uh, and we will see you next time on Frame Rate. 